Hello, I'm Scott Hochhalter, Assistant Director of Admissions at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. I'd like to welcome you to our photography and Photoshop demonstration in conjunction with the All-American High School Film Festival and Jostens. MCAD is a small four-year private college educating individuals to become professional artists and designers, effective critical leaders, and creative thinkers. We have the highest level of accreditation offering bachelor's, master's uh, degrees in media, communications, design, as well as fine arts. Students learn technical and professional skills from traditional to cutting edge in a close-knit, supportive, and enabling community. Our students are some of the most talented young artists and designers in the country. college life to the fullest extent. Filmmaking as an art form is a combination of all kinds of art. There's anything inside, there's photography, there's acting, there's paintings, there's visual effects, there's animation. When you think of animation, you think of just moving pictures, but it's way more than that. The fact that this school is 24 7 open, it's really, really important. To be able to check out equipment here at the school, this is really helpful. Everything that I need is here. One of the things I appreciate the most is that the classes are very small. I always feel I have a very close connection to the professor and can talk with them. I love the city because there's so much to do all around Minneapolis. Be excited about learning, be okay with failure, and you learn that way and you grow. If you're thinking about going to MCAD, do it. Photog Fest Presented by Jostens is the latest initiative from the team that created the All-American High School Film Festival. Their mission is to provide a grand stage for the next generation of talented student photographers, connecting them with the resources, recognition, and rewards they deserve. Each year in New York City, PhotogFest showcases hundreds of official selection photos submitted by high school students from all over the world. The festival includes hands-on workshops and an immersive photo walk hosted by photography professionals, networking parties, an interactive technology showcase, and the Teen Indie Awards show, featuring a red carpet experience and thousands of dollars in prizes and scholarships, including the grand prize, a $72,000 scholarship to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. We can't wait to see what the world looks like through your lens. Photogfest.com. So as we begin, I do want to let you know that there are a couple of things to think about. There's a chat function available for you to ask questions, and we will get to these about two-thirds of the way through the webinar um, with our guest presenter. So if there are questions that we can answer, we will do that um, during the presentation. But please be patient. Also, there is a PDF document attached to the email instructions on connecting you that you received earlier. Please do use that to follow along. It has multiple links to further check out and can be a great resource for you in the future. sweeps all the time for shooting stuff. I shoot a lot of stuff on green screen. Nothing worse than being somewhere and you just don't have enough lights. But that's uh, never an issue in the studio. MCAT has a lot of gallery space, but it's nice having the black box being a space that is not white. It's, it's dark. It's good for showing films, showing installation pieces. Just something different. We also have a dark room, which is used for developing photos. And we have the media center. Don't be afraid to come in, get your hands in all of it. I check tons of stuff out just to see how it works. And for a lot of my projects, I'll step into the sound studio just to really use the great speaker system in there. For the spaces, you can check them out during the day, overnight, over the weekends. I mean, just whenever you really need it. Through classes and different activities here, you slowly, you get used to it and you become a pro in no time.
Now, live in the Grace Studio, it is my pleasure to introduce a couple of people helping make this production possible. First of all, we have Mary Kazura, Associate Director of Admissions and an MCAT alumni, and our cameraman, Phil Countryman, MCAT alumni as well. And finally, our featured speaker, Tom Beerline. Hi, I'm Tom Beerline. I'm a current student here at MCAD. Uh, I'm a second semester junior, uh, and I am a fine arts studio major studying photography and sculpture. So thanks for joining us in the Gray Studio for the portrait, lighting, and edit demo. Uh, I thought I'd start out by talking a little bit about what I do at MCAD and kind of how I got here and how my work has changed since I started here. So I started here two years ago and did pretty much exclusively uh, digital photography. And I came in as a photography major and thought that that's the only thing I wanted to do. Um, but since I've been here, I've been experimenting with three-dimensional work and sculpture, uh, large format photography, using our dark rooms and things like that. Uh, and if you do have the PDF, download it. There's some images of my work um, available right at the top of the thing there. So, like I said, I do some large format photography as well as digital, uh, and that kind of led to me experimenting with sculptural works uh, and kind of moving away from the mechanical digital photography realm and moving into uh, a more physical medium. And at MCAD, I am a photographer at DesignWorks right now, so I photograph most of our events and uh, faculty headshots and our classes and things like that. And so it's a little bit different than when we're in the studio here. It's a little bit more reactionary, and you have to kind of just be um, changing your settings with whatever lighting you have available. And within the studio here, we really have the opportunity to control every aspect of the light and of the exposure so you can really get a perfect picture like right away and you don't have to be um, correcting too much in post. Uh, in addition to doing sculpture and photography, I'm also a teaching artist minor. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce Linda here as the, the director for that. Hey Tom, we're so happy to have Tom here as part of our teaching artist minor and in the, in the teaching artist minor here at the college enables our BFA students, uh, art and design students, to work uh, through their disciplines and teach out in the community and schools. It's really an, uh, an opportunity for you to take your studio practice and make it meaning, meaningful of, for others. We do this through a whole uh, a group of courses. So if you have more interest in that, please look at the MCAD uh, intranet site and you'll find out what that's all about. So good luck, Tom. Happy Thanks. to have you doing this here. So with that, I'd like to direct you to page 11. Uh, I have some kind of documentation studio shots for us to look at and think about how shooting in the studio is a little bit different than shooting outside or shooting in like um, an interior setting. So on page 11, 13, and 14, there's images of just documentation that I've done of other students' work here at the school. Um, but it really allows you to control every aspect of the light. And so you can kind of be patient and take your time and make sure that your exposure is gonna be right and your image is exactly the way you want it. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Ian for the portrait lighting demo and talk about kind of how we're gonna do this tonight. Hello, my name is Ian. I'm also a fine arts studio major at MCAD and I use they, them pronouns. Just letting you guys know so you don't get confused during the demo. Thanks. So you wanna take a seat right here. So we're gonna talk about this image over here which is on frame 16. Uh, this is kind of the final image that we're going for today uh, with the basic three light setup in the studio, a back, a fill, and then a key light. Um, and as you can see, we've got all of those set up here. And I'd like to kind of talk about all the equipment that we're gonna be using today. So I'm shooting with a Canon Mark III, uh, and then I've got a Canon 24 to 105 millimeter lens on there. Uh, and we use our Dynalite kits, which I have an example of. <coughs> so these are our strobes that we're gonna be using. And you can see on top of them, we've got the soft box um, to kind of diffuse the light so it's not quite as harsh. And we've got a couple of them here, lighting Ian. And I'm gonna hit the lights quick, and I wanna go over kind of how each light is affecting the, uh, the overall image and kind of what role it's gonna be playing for us. Scott, could you hit the lights for us?
All right, so this is our backlight back here. And really what it's doing is just illuminating the backdrop so we get rid of any shadows that the fill or the key light is gonna be kind of projecting. And um, this kind of makes for a nice even background and I use the red backdrop because I kind of like the really saturated even background to kind of contrast uh, the model. And then we'll move on to the fill light. So the fill light is kind of the secondary light, and what it's going to do is make sure that from our key light, we're not going to have too many harsh shadows on the nose. Uh, and I kind of really like to just do a very basic, full um, lighting setup, nothing like too dramatic, no big hard shadows or anything like that. Um, so I've got the three soft boxes with all three of them to kind of diffuse everything out that way. And this is the key light. So this is kind of our main light. Um, it's the biggest. I'm using a medium soft box instead of the small ones over here. And this is kind of like the focus of the light, kind of hitting directly on the front of the face. And as you can see, creating those shadows that our fill light is going to get rid of. So with all three lights set up, we're going to do a couple of shots here and then we can move into how we're going to kind of edit them in post. All right, perfect. Thanks, Ian, for helping out. You're all set. <laughs> can we get the lights back on, Scott? All right, so we've got the picture, um, and I think we can move into doing the editing portion now. So if you guys could help me move these lights out of the way a little bit. And then maybe grab that one. I'll slide the TV in. Yeah, go ahead and run there. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to grab this. All right, so the portrait edit is going to get started on page 20. And I'll try and keep you updated on what page I'm moving into and kind of go through this step by step a little bit slowly for you. So I'm going to open the photograph in Bridge. And I photographed it in RAW, so we have our RAW editor open. And that kind of allows me to just move around and really check for exposure, for contrast, and for color, and do some like basic edits to that. So you can see on page 22, we're going to open up our image in Photoshop. And then what you're going to want to make sure is that your adjustments window is on. So we can do exposure and contrast with the levels tools. And if that's not showing up for you, you can just go to window and adjustments right here, and just make sure that it's checked on. So the first thing we're going to do, even though we correct it for exposure and contrast and color in Camera Raw, I just like to make sure that we do it in Photoshop as well. And it's just the three basic layers that I do to every single photograph to make sure it looks as realistic and um, as it possibly can, kind of the closest to what it actually was looking like. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the Levels layer. And you can see that the histogram is going to pop up here. And there's three arrows kind of pointing out the shadows, the midtones, and the, uh, the highlights. 
And our image is a little bit dark, so I'm going to take that highlight arrow and drag it down just to the edge of the histogram so everything's kind of available there. Next, on page 24, we've got the contrast. And so what we're going to do a curves layer for contrast, which is right next to exposure over here. And I've got it highlighted in the PowerPoint. And on the contrast, it's going to show that histogram again that we kind of just correct it for. And there's a diagonal line going from the shadows to the highlights. And there's two points here that are kind of crossing in between. And I'm just going to make two dots. Fix that. Right there. Uh, and we're going to create an S-curve with that to kind of bring the shadows down uh, to be a little bit deeper and richer, and then bring the highlights up a little bit. So I'm just going to use the arrow keys to kind of move it. We don't want to do it a whole lot. It doesn't want to be, I don't want it to be like really crazy contrast and really unrealistic. So just deepening those and bringing the highlights up a little bit until it looks a little bit more natural. Then on 25, we've got the color layer. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to create a, con or a uh, curves layer, just like we did before. New blank one. And uh, over here, we've got the mode for the layer. And everything up to this point has just been on normal. But for color, I'm actually going to go into the menu, scroll down, and then select for color. That way, we're not actually adjusting any lights. We just wanted to affect kind of the hue of the image. Um, and in our menu here, we've got our RGB. And we're going to go one further and separate each one so we can correct for every individual color. So I'm going to start with red. And rather than selecting the two points that we did for the contrast, I'm just going to select right in the middle. And we've got the nice red backdrop. And so I'm kind of going to just amplify the reds a little bit more to kind of exaggerate that. And then we'll move on to green. Um, and I think that the image looks a little bit green. So you can see if I boost this all the way up here, it's really going to go crazy. Uh, and the opposite is going to be magenta. So we're just going to kind of move gently towards magenta, and kind of get rid of the green hue for the skin tone. And then finally, we're going to do the blue. And again, if we go up with the blue, it's way too much. And the opposite is going to be yellow. So what I would like to do is maybe just boost the blue a little bit to kind of cool it off. And if you're ever kind of like wondering how far you've gone with any of these edits, you can just select that little eyeball and hide it or bring it back. And you can kind of see the way that it's being changed. So now that we kind of correct it for the very basics, um, we're going to move into actually doing a little bit more of the portrait edit. So what you're going to do is take your background layer and just drag it down to that little page with kind of the folded corner. And we're just going to duplicate it two times. And I'm going to name the first duplicate color whoops, blur. And the second one I'm going to call texture. And again, if you're following along on the PowerPoint, you can see all of these things a little bit closer up. Uh, on page 28 is where we start kind of moving into the color blur layer. So I'm going to turn off my texture. We're going to use that later. Select my color blur. And then we're going to go up to filter, come down to blur, and I'm going to use a Gaussian blur. And it's really easy, at least for me, to get carried away doing this. So it's best, kind of like the key, is just looking at the eyebrows. I'm going to turn it all the way off and just blur it enough 
for the eyebrows to become kind of one solid shape. If you go too far with it, it's going to just look really blurry and really unrecognizable. Um, so 2.7 pixels is kind of where I land it, and that's generally about around where you want to be. And then, OK. So on page 30, we've got the texture layer next. I'm going to turn that back on, just clicking that little box. And it's going to cover up everything we just did. So from there, I'm going to select my texture layer, go up to Image. And I'm going to hit Apply Image right down here. And then I kind of like zoomed in on the menu here on page 31, so you can see this over again. But we're going to make sure that the layer, we want it to only apply to our color blur layer that we just edited. And then from there, we're going to be on RGB. Make sure you check the invert box here. And I'll move this over so you can take a look. We're going to change the blending mode from multiply to add, and I'm going to change the scale to 2. And then you should have this grayed out kind of image, um, almost like a line drawing, and we're just going to hit OK there. And just like we did with the color layer, we're going to change our layer mode from normal to linear light, if I can find it. There we go. And if we zoom back out, both of those edits ultimately are going to look like unchanged. You want it to still look like the original photograph. If it's too blurry, you went too far in your color layer. And if there's like a lot of grit or like noise happening in it, then you probably went too far in the texture layer. So I'm going to turn both of those back on. Sorry, Ian, for editing your face right in front of you. Um, but On page 32, I kind of selected the Healing Brush tool and the Clone Stamp, and those are the two tools we're going to use for these layers. In your Color Blur layer, we're going to use the Clone Stamp, and this is going to correct for like skin color, um, like kind of redness of the skin. Um, so if you're shooting outside and it's cold out and everybody has red noses, you can kind of like bring that down with this. Um, but first. I'm going to go into Texture, and there's this little Band-Aid, kind of fifth one down, called the Spot Healing Brush. And we're going to do that first to just fix any kind of like blemishes and kind of smooth the skin. And this is something that I see all the time that people go crazy with. If you've ever seen portraits where they're just totally blown out and the skin is just like completely plastic, um, we don't want to go that far. So we still want to look as natural as we can, and maybe we'll just select a couple areas, and you can tell if it's working by it kind of blurring, because it's going to show that background. And we'll just select a couple other points. All right, now we'll move on to the clone stamp. And right where we kind of select it for texture, we're just going to go back in, select kind of this shaded area of the cheek. and fill it in. And if you're having troubles and you kind of like see that full circle, we make sure that your opacity is up to 100% over here. And then if it's not, you can just like turn it down to kind of get the blend back to normal. And I'll fix a couple other points here. So ultimately, you're going to see just like a really minor change, which I kind of highlight it on page 33. So if I turn these two layers off, zoom back in, 
you can see it's just a little bit of a change, but it still looks like natural skin. It doesn't look too plasticky or too like photoshopped. So moving on from that, we're going to do a couple more layers before we're finished up here. We'll zoom back out. So we're going to do a lighten and a darken layer to kind of highlight um, a little bit more contrast in the face. And I'm just going to select my curves again, just like I did for contrast and for color. I'm going to name one of them Lighten. And the other one Darken, if I can select it. So kind of similar to what we did for the color layers, I'm just going to select right in the middle. And I'm just going to exaggerate this lightning. And then over here, we have the mask box selected. And if you select there and you hit Command-I, it's going to cover it up and make sure that it's not totally affecting every part of the image. And then we're going to do the same for darken. And get rid of it. So on page 36, I kind of went over the path of how we're going to affect these layers and the way that you're going to want to use this layer. So we're going to select the mask and then use the brush tool over here. And I want to make sure that I've got the white brush selected. And I'm going to kind of just create a T right across the forehead and then down the face to highlight the front. And one thing to make sure of is your opacity should be set down to probably about like 65, someplace around there. And then, and even that is a little bit much, so I'm going to turn it down to 60. And you can see kind of how it's affecting Ian's picture. And then we're going to bring it back with the darken layer and go in and make sure that we're not blowing out all of the shadows. Same thing, kind of stay at like a 60% opacity. A little bit smaller brush size. And on page 37, I kind of laid it out. But usually what I try to do is just darken the sides of the nose again so it doesn't look too bright. Maybe a little bit on that side. And then the jawline, kind of make that a little bit smaller too. And usually I'll kind of go on the either side of the forehead and the mouth. So as you can see, kind of altering the way that, that light is affecting the model. So to kind of pull it back to what we've been looking at here, it still looks pretty similar to our first image that we took. Um, and that's because being in the studio, you really have access to deciding exactly what lights you want to use. And it's really all up to your control. So you should be able to get a pretty good picture um, right away. And our edit. We'll turn it all the way off. Doesn't look completely photoshopped, I hope. And uh, still looks like a natural portrait. Just a little bit more saturation, a little higher contrast, and a little higher exposure as well. And I think that's everything I've got. So if we want to turn it over to do some questions. Thank you, Tom.
Yeah, there's been a lot of good activity, good chatter here on the chat function. Um, and I love that you guys are helping each other out. That's super great. Um, there's some suggestions for um, like other YouTubers that are uh, doing some good uh, Photoshop. And I believe that there was um, some suggestions about other uh, programs to use that uh, may be free. A question for you, do you know, uh, are students able to get Photoshop uh, if they can't get it in their school? Uh, is there a way for them to get a student account? Yeah, so if you just scan your student ID, um, you can, I think you, when you sign up you can email it to them and then you get a student discount that's I think $10 a month and you get Photoshop, Bridge, and Lightroom for all of that. So it makes it pretty, pretty cheap. Okay, good. Well, I'm gonna start here. Um, I've only kind of been monitoring the um, chat function. Uh, Mary Kazura has been at the helm. Um, but I see this, this question that just came in. Do you feel, or I'm sorry, yeah. Do you feel like you came out of high school with enough knowledge of lighting or all natural lighting? Um, I personally did not come out of high school with all of that knowledge. We had a studio um, where I went to high school and we had access to kind of doing that, but a lot of it has also been um, learned while I've been here at MCAD uh, and had access to kind of just exploring this studio and how to use these lights. And Chris G commented that um, $10 a month uh, as far as the Photoshop. Yes. And I think yep. that's I think that's accurate Photoshop, as well. Photoshop, yeah, Lightroom and Bridge. And I know you can, it's a little bit more if you want the whole creative suite with like InDesign and Illustrator, but if you're just doing photography, then it's only $10. So we have another question. Um, what would you say is the latest trend for Photoshop design? Oh man, it's a tough question. Um, I am not too sure what the latest trend for Photoshop design is. Uh, I really just use Photoshop as a way to do a little bit of camera correction. Um, and I'll use it in kind of my large format photography as well to fix any issues I've had um, with analog cameras. But I don't really go beyond that most of the time. So we have someone commenting on um uh, the, the Missy 3307 says at max on phones you can use snap speed. So we do have an ex uh, another recommendation. Thank you, Missy. Um, here's a question. Is there any way to take pictures with bad lighting? Taking pictures with bad lighting. I'm going to assume that bad lighting is limited lighting and that it's probably a dark area. And the best thing to do is have a tripod um, if you can. If you can't, definitely just like, um, like I've done photos before where you just stack up a bunch of books or use a stool, but anything that you can set your camera down on, and then you're gonna wanna go to a really low shutter speed uh, and a really high ISO. The issue with going with a higher ISO is after you pass about 1600 for an ISO, you're gonna start to see the noise uh, and the pixelation in the image a lot. So you can typically just turn your shutter speed way down and stay at around an 800 ISO, and you should be able to kind of get some decent images with that. So Missy also wants to know um, Nikon or Canon and why? Uh, I think I've actually been using Sony for most of my career. I use Canons here at the school, um, and we have access to renting out both Nikons and Canons. Um, but I would say Sony for myself because there's something nice about the, I think they call it the live view feature. So that instead of looking through your viewfinder and seeing exactly what the camera sees, seeing what you see rather. So if you're in a dark area and you look through your viewfinder, you're not gonna be able to see anything. But with a Sony, it's actually an LCD screen. So when you adjust your settings, just like your live feed on your camera, you can actually look through the viewfinder and still like compose your photographs, which has been kind of the most beneficial thing for me to use. So I'm going to uh, kind of look inward here. What is the benefit of perhaps college uh, in general, art school, and what are some of the opportunities that you have with that? Yeah, um, so 
I've been, this is my third school that I've attended now, so I went to a university, a community college, uh, and to an art school now. And I've had the best experience here because I know that if I am really interested in making it in the arts, that uh, this is the place with the most opportunity, and there's a really good creative community both in the faculty and staff, uh, or faculty, staff, and students. Uh, but everybody is just making work all the time and supporting each other making work. And that's not something I kind of got when I was at MCTC at our community college downtown. Um, so I would say the community of an art school has been the most influential thing um, for my experience. Thank you, Tom. So um, we do have a question. Will you do a live lesson on camera modes and features? Camera modes and features. Um, depends on the camera mode, the camera settings, maybe? Yeah, or like is the there something, a brief, maybe tutorial overview of camera you'd modes. like to do or talk about right now? Yeah, I mean, we could go over the basics of like aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, and those kind of things. Um, it's a little bit difficult without being able to actually display it. So maybe that's better for another, uh, another webinar when we have a little more time to get into it. Yeah, OK. Let's see. Oh, well, I guess we asked the question, what um, do people like to take photos of? Sorry, it's going so fast. What have you all been taking pictures of, and what is your favorite subject? So let me throw that to you, Tom. What, what do you like to photograph? Uh, I like to photograph outdoors, mostly, um, landscape photography, and uh, more recently, kind of like sculptural photographs. So I, since I started school here, um, I had access to using a 4x5 large format camera, which kind of totally changed the way I look at photography because it's way different than using a digital where you can just photograph over and over and over again. Um, with the large format, you actually have to change out the slides. It's a lot more hands-on, and it really forces you to be really patient. So um, I think doing that kind of photography is the most fulfilling because it just feels a little bit more, um, just more hands-on, I think, and more tactile. And when you kind of get one of those four by five negatives to actually be correct, um, there's a lot more feeling of accomplishment than kind of the spray and pray approach of digital, digital SLRs, I think. And then does MCAD focus on the business end of the arts? Uh, yes, MCAD does. So there's a program called Entrepreneurial Studies that is basically all about um, applying the business side to arts and how they can kind of be a pretty strong partnership. So um, do you use a mirrorless camera? And if you do, do which ones? Uh, I've not actually used a mirrorless before, but I've heard really good things. Again, not that I should be like repping Sony here, but uh, I've heard good things about the Sony, I think it's A700, A7000. Um, and the benefit of that, I think, is just the size. It's like um, way smaller than carrying around one of our DSLRs. Um, it's a little bit quieter too, so it's a really good thing for traveling and street photography. Uh, it seems to be a pretty good option. Okay, I see that Missy takes pictures of Lake Erie, so go Ohio. Um, Buckeyes? Buckeyes, yeah, that's right. Um, when and where is the appropriate time to use which features? That's a little, um, a little ambiguous. Got it, got it. Mm. What, okay, let's see. Can you please tell me what settings you're using for your portrait pictures? Yes, so in that PDF document, 
on page, if I can find it here, I think it's something like page eight or nine, I lay out all of the settings that I use for this. So it was an ISO of 100, uh, an f-stop of nine, and a shutter speed of 160. Okay, great. So we can actually refer to that PDF that you, that, uh, you created. Yeah, and that's actually something I want to um, kind of repeat and make sure that everybody knows. So everything that I just did up here is laid out in the PDF step by step. So you can replay these and like use this portrait edit for your own photographs. This is also not an edit that you have to do in the studio. It makes it easier in the studio, but it's really good if you're shooting outside, if you're shooting um, really in any environment. You can always use this portrait edit to kind of like really Make sure your your um, portraits are really good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What is the word I'm thinking of? Um, yeah. So you can apply those to anything and then just follow that along step by step. So how easy is it to edit black and white photos? Um, it's pretty easy. It's it's basically everything we just did, but you drop the color layer. Um, so it's the same kind of, you are still looking for exposure and contrast. Um, and there's a couple of different options within Photoshop to make your image black and white. So you can apply all these edits and then turn black and white on and be left with a pretty great black and white photo. And what is your favorite color? My favorite color is orange. Thank you for asking. Wow, no yeah. hesitation. Yep, it's like that. What tips do you have for nature photography? Um, for nature photography, I think the biggest tip I have is being patient um, and timing. I think that a lot of people try to take nature pictures and wildlife photographs um, at like noon when the sun is the highest and everything's just kind of blown out. The best thing I can say is really making sure that you're like waking up with the sunrise or being around at sunset and waiting for those images to happen. It's not quite like being in the studio where you can create the environment. It's a lot more reactionary, and so you have to be kind of ready to wait for that and be there when it happens. So Kelly says, we only have two soft lights in our high school studio. Could you essentially use one as a fill and back if placed right and the second one for key? Um, worried about her AP work. Um, you could probably do that. You could also, I would maybe recommend getting rid of the fill. So using the backlight, because the, really the biggest issue is like creating those really harsh shadows. Um, so if you got rid of the fill light, and then maybe make the key light a little bit more central, you can probably get rid of a lot of the shadows um, and still have a nice backdrop. Or what I might recommend doing too is just like grabbing an another light that you have access to. If you have um, a light that doesn't have a softbox on it, just using that as your backlight. Um, and then trying to correct that in Photoshop later is uh, another good option. Now, did you meter the light beforehand? I did not. Um, I did not because I have the DSLR and I just like photographed until it looked right. But if you have a meter and you know how to use it, that's fantastic. All right. So what are your tips for taking photos while on the road or traveling? Tips for photos on the road. Bring a lot of SD cards, I think. Um, make sure that you have space and that you have a laptop that you can transfer all your images to because it's frustrating to be out on the road and not want to delete any of your pictures, um, but then you can't take any more. And I would also say to have a pretty mid-range lens um, so that you're not like stuck with a zoom or whatever. You can just kind of photograph everything. Now Noah says, um, or is asking, when should you use exposure bracketing? Do you use exposure bracketing? Ever? I use exposure bracketing um, mostly when I'm shooting large format, and a lot of times that's for making sure that I'm going to get a good exposure. So if I don't quite know what, I, what exposure I should be at, I'll bracket so I kind of just like burn two pieces of film, but I know I have one good exposure. Um, it's maybe less important with a digital, but also something that's good for bracketing is when you're like shooting those sunsets maybe, and you have really low lights and really high lights. When you bracket in Photoshop, you can kind of fuse those three things together and have one really clean exposure and photograph. 
And Lakia is asking, uh, in my studio, I only have the old bell lamps. I'm unsure what lamp I can use so that my photos won't, c won't come out yellowish. Do you have any advice for that? Yes, so in your um, camera, there's the white balance that you can correct. Uh, and you can also do it with your color layer here. So going back to this for a second, and this is why you name your layers, which I did not do, so I know what I'm doing. If my photograph were to be really yellow, you kind of have like a hue to it like that, you would just take this blue layer and then boost it way up until it kind of like counteracts that and you get a more balanced color. Is there anything that you can do with lights to counteract that yellow? Um, mostly it's just your white balance. Um, in your camera, you should be able to set it for incandescent and then that will like take out a lot of the yellow. If it's still yellow, um, you could try doing like a, you know, um, homemade softbox and just like I've used like a white bed sheet or something like that and just hang that over your light to diffuse it and it should get rid of some of that too. So Riley asked a question and I know that MCAT admissions also answered it but from your perspective Tom, uh, in work submitted for competitions what will the judges be looking for in your picture? Are there certain color schemes or subjects they'll grade higher for? I would have to say it's pretty dependent on the judge and it's on the person who's going to be looking at the work. So what I would recommend doing for any of those kind of competitions is looking up who's during the competition and then see what their work is like, see what's gotten in years earlier, um, and then kind of cater your portfolio to that. Not that you should be making work just to fit that show, but m maybe choose your images a little bit more wisely uh, in relation to those. So um, Kyra says, what software do you like to use the most to edit photos? Definitely Photoshop. Um, I use Photoshop for everything. And uh, we use the raw editor as like the first step here. Lightroom is really great for raw editing. Um, and it's a little bit more intricate. And so you can usually skip this step uh, in Photoshop, but I've always used Photoshop and just feel very comfortable um, within it. I sort of left out that they're partial to Lightroom. Oh, see? Good. Lightroom is also great. I just am like always using Photoshop, so. Did you learn on Photoshop? You learned yeah. Photoshop first? Yep, Photoshop first. Like right from high school I learned um, Photoshop and then have just been using it ever since, which is probably similar to like why I like Sony so much is I just started using that and felt comfortable with it. So if you have too much grain in a photo, can you edit it in Photoshop to fix it? Um, you, it depends on how much grain there is. Um, so within your filter, <laughs> let me select my background. There's a noise um, tab here, and you can do reduce noise. Uh, you can also try to blur certain areas of the image to kind of clean that up. But really, if your image is really noisy, um, there's not a ton you can do to do that, which is why you want to stay around an 800 ISO for the most part. I'm going to lighten it up again. Um, who are some of your favorite photographers? My favorite photographers would be um, Hiroshi Sujimoto is one of my favorites. Um, they have a beautiful series about seascapes. Again, large format photography. Alex Soth here in Minneapolis is one of my favorite photographers. Um, and they do really great portraits. So if you're interested in portraiture, they, do, um, they don't do a ton of studio portraiture, but more kind of like out, um, outdoors and things like that. So I'd say those are my two favorites out of everybody. All right, you may or may not know this, but what is your opinion on the Sony A6000? I do not know much about the Sony A6000. I just know I use my um, Sony A77. Uh, next question is, do, uh, or I'm kind of uh, putting it all together, but Adobe has Photoshop um, for cell phones. Have you used that? I've used it a few times, and it's actually pretty impressive how much you can alter it. And it goes a little bit further than just applying 
filters onto your images. Um, and I use my phone to document when I don't have a camera. I, can, I use that for a few things. Uh, and having that Photoshop app kind of allows me to still create some pretty decent images. I don't think it's a replacement for um, a DSLR in Photoshop, but it's kind of good for a quick fix. And what sort of life tips do you have for us? Life tips. Life tips. Oh, man. that's a, Go back to the favorite color question. I know. Uh, um, life tips. I don't know. I would say, for myself anyway, I knew that I wanted to be an artist when I was 18. I tried to make other pathways to kind of like figure something else out. And I think that if you are interested in doing this professionally, um, and you think that's what you want to do uh, as a career, then you should go for it. And you should really just like jump in with both feet and make sure you run at it. There's enough cliches in there. I'm going to take your advice. Yeah. I like <laughs> it. You're going to go to MCAP? Possibly. So um, do you ever print your photos, or do you just leave them on your computer? What's, what's your thought on that? I print my photos. I think it comes from also being a sculptor and liking the tactility of like actually having an object. I think we see images on like screens on Instagram and Facebook all the time. And there's something completely different about a printed image that you can hold and look at that isn't backlit as well. It's a huge difference. And I would always recommend printing off your photos if you're going to show them. So a follow-up question to that is glossy, matte, luster, pearl. Um, What's your preference? I, I use luster for most things, or semi-gloss. Um, but I think it kind of depends on the image, too, because I've seen glossy is just a little bit too much. So I would say semi-gloss or luster. That sounds nice. Um, what about printing? Like, Do you have any recommendations? These are kids across the country, if not the world. Where can they do that? Um, that's a good question. I have always kind of used, like here at school, we have a bunch of um, printers we have access to 24 seven. And that's the only thing I've ever really used before. But you can also usually ship them out or like order them online. So if you don't have access to a printer, you can send them their, your file uh, digitally and then they'll send you back a print. I just don't know those places um, offhand. I think, you know, and once again, I'm speaking for Minneapolis. There are a couple of uh, pretty reasonable places um, still, you know, yeah, throughout like White the city. House, I think, is one um, in Minnesota. Hmm? West Photo does it, too. Yeah, that's true. National Camera will print them, too, and they're usually all over the place. Well, what do you know now that you wish you knew in high school? Hmm, I wish that I, hmm, that's like a lot of things I wish I knew when I was in high school. Uh, I wish that I knew all of the options there were um, to being an artist. And so like Linda was up here earlier, um, but since I've come to school here, I learned about this whole career as a teaching artist, which I had never known about before. I thought if you were an artist, you could teach at a college or you could make artwork or you could go into like advertising. Um, so I wish I kind of knew the spectrum of options that, I, that you actually have. Uh, going back a question, have you ever put your pictures on canvas? Um, I have not, but I've seen pictures on canvas. Um, I typically like pictures just on photo paper, unless you have a really good reason why you're going to put it on canvas, because it totally changes that texture and the look of your image. So if you have a reason for doing it, I think you can, like a lot of people, pull it off. So we have a few people chattering about Office Max as probably a place to uh, print their yeah. photos. Yeah, and um, I do see um, Lakia says, I like Office Max, but I always bring my own paper. That sounds like a good insider, a good yeah, like pro tip. It. Yeah, exactly. Well, what do you want to do with your degree? Once you graduate, what do you plan on doing? Uh, I would say I plan on teaching um, and staying in kind of this education community that I really enjoy being within. Uh, and I also want to get my own studio and become a practicing artist. Um, on my own and try to support myself with the education. 
Ooh. All right, let's see if there's any more questions that come in. I know that sometimes with technology uh, around the globe again, sometimes they're a little slow, but we only have a few minutes left, so if any of you have any questions that you want Tom to answer right now, um, please, please answer, ask those questions. Um, you have a compliment from Chris G. You would be a great teacher. Thank you, Chris. Yes, <laughs> currently. Oh yeah, life tips. Hey, he's the same guy. <laughs> Any more life tips? Uh, you know, I, I sort of wanted to go up and answer a question. Surprisingly, on our end, we are not, we've been typing and it hasn't been showing up. But um, we had answered Riley's question about what uh, admissions portfolios, what we are looking for, are technically well done photos that also have a, has a concept or subject that really grabs us. And I'm going to hand it to Mary Kazura to answer that. Hello, everybody. I am actually the voice behind the chatting and, uh, or the typing. And what I would say about a technically well done photo is that I'm looking for something that you know, it's white balanced, it's in focus, it's a really sharp looking photo. That's what I mean by technical. And then I guess the other half of a, a really great photo is something that's going to grab you in terms of the, the concept or the idea or the story that you're telling, the passion that you put into it. Um, so that was one of the comments that I made. And I think another comment that I made, um, somebody asked about Alec Soth. Um, and the name is A-L-E-C... And last name is S O T H. E there we go. Yep, that's it. So just wanted to make sure you guys got a chance to do that. And I think I'm gonna hand it back to Scott, but thanks again for listening. Okay, so a couple of questions came in last moment. We are going to wrap up in just a couple of minutes. How long have you been in school for, Tom? Oh, that's okay. I've been in school for a while, so like I said, I've done, um, been to three different schools. So all in all, I'm on year five right now, five or six. Uh, I've been at MCAD for the last two years. Why did you start elsewhere? Uh, I think it had a lot to do with my family uh, kind of thinking Maybe you don't actually want to do this. Maybe you'd be better off in a place that has a lot of options and a really large community. And I do think that's a really great option still, and I enjoyed being a freshman there. But I think that if I actually, like I knew that I wanted to be an artist, coming to MCAT has been the best decision um, for me. And we only have about 800 students or so. And it's just like a nice, tight-knit community. Um, and everybody here is like practicing artists, and so everyone has very similar interests, um, and we're all kind of trying to do similar things. Uh, sounds like a utopia. Sounds I like, like it. Utopia. Okay, uh, Trippets has asked a couple of times. I'm getting to you, Trippets. 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 Tar pits. Okay. Uh, what zoom lens would you recommend on a budget of like $100? There's usually a pretty great like 70 to 300 millimeter zoom lens I think. Uh, a lot of times if you look at kind of like your first kit um, for a DSLR it'll come with uh, kind of a more moderate lens and then a zoom and you can buy those for I want to say even $70 or something like that and there's always like a Canon, Nikon or Sony version of those. Okay, and then uh, Missy3307 says, I have two models. What would you suggest for moving photos? And they clarify that as in photos where my models are doing work. Um, I would, if you're in a studio, definitely lighting and staying above, I would say like 125 for a shutter speed. But in general, no matter what you're doing, if you're trying to photograph somebody moving, I would try and stay above 125 or higher. 
um, which means you're probably going to have to bring your aperture a little bit down or your ISO up. But as long as it's well lit, um, you shouldn't have a problem. All right. Well, Tom, I want to thank you so much. Thank you. And everyone, of course, thank you for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure. Um, I hope you learned a lot uh, from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design at the All-American High School Film Festival in Jostens. A sincere thank you for attending our webinar.